Hello, welcome to today's Blue Waters webinar. I'm Scott Lathrop with the Blue Waters Project at the National Center for Superpeating Applications at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It's my pleasure today to introduce Sanjay Kale, who is a Paul and Cynthia Saylor Professor in Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And today he'll be talking about Charm++ and Adaptive MPI with that. Thank you for joining us, Sanjay, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I, I'm going to be talking about CHAMP++ and Adaptive MPI. Many of you heard, might have heard me talking uh, about them before, so let me at the beginning uh, clarify what, what will be new. Uh, I will be talking about some new material about Adaptive MPI and uh, some of the new within node um, parallelism handling things. Um, and I'm hoping that there, there are a number of you uh, who, who are relatively new to uh, this idea, and I'm hoping that afterwards we'll be curious and explore uh, Champ++ and Ad Adaptive MPI as software, as parallel programming methodologies that you want to use. Um, I, some standard uh, issues that most people uh, know by now, the applications in, in parallel computing are getting more sophisticated. We want uh, um, multi-scale, multi-module, multi-physics applications with all kinds of adaptive refinements. Um, we need strong scaling. We're not satisfied with just going to a bigger problem on a bigger machine. We want to solve the same problem faster. Um, and then we have to deal with the hardware that's getting increasingly complex, and in particular, showing a lot of variability in its speed in variety of ways, uh, statically and dynamically, in its heterogeneity of the processor types, and so on. So uh, uh, our view for dealing with these challenges is not to seek full automation, not some kind of automagical parallelization, uh, but not full burden of parallel programming on the app developers either. Rather, we seek a good division of labor between the system and the application developers. Um, and, and we also want to develop our technology driven by the needs of real application. So I'm going to talk about CHAMP++. So let me first say what CHAMP++ is not. It is not a new language like Lisp is a different language. It is an alternative to the likes of MPI, but not to the likes of C++. In fact, you program in C++ when you write CHAMP++ programs. So it, uh, so it represents a different style or different approach to writing parallel programs. It represents an adaptive runtime system and the ecosystem that sur uh, surrounds it. There are three basic ideas in uh, CHAMP++. The over-decomposition, migratability, and asynchrony. Let me introduce uh, them very briefly. The first idea is we want the programmer to decompose their computation, their work units and data units, into a large number of pieces, much more than the number of execution units you have. The execution units, you may think of them as cores, or you may think of them as nodes, but you need to have a, sig a significantly larger number of uh, these units. And, but that's something that we normally do in MPI programming. We do decomposition, we just overdo it. Uh, the second uh, feature is migratability. These work units and data units are migratable at runtime. That is, a programmer or runtime can move them from node to node, processor to processor. This actually is pretty simple to deal with for the application developer. You just have to address your messages or communication to the logical units rather than to the physical processor. Of course, under the hood, the runtime system needs to do a lot of location management, and it, does it uh, needs to do it efficiently. Given that there are a large number of these entities on each processor, the question is, who gets to run next? There can be two views about it. One is let the programmer decide, and the other one is implicit, that is, let the runtime decide based on availability of messages and data. It is this latter view that CHAMP++ takes. Uh, so that means, uh, that means there's going to be a scheduler that's going to say which data is available, which meth method invocations are available, and pick those objects to run. A picture might illustrate this better. So, um, so in CHAMP++, the over decomposed entities have a name. They are called chars. Chars are just C++ objects which happen to have some methods. These are, these are desig designated as entry methods. And these entry methods can be invoked remotely, asynchronously, by remote chars. And these chars are organized into index collections. You might have a 1D collection. You might have another 6D collection. It might be sparse. 
with an array of charts going from one to a trillion, but only 10,000 of them exist. Um, and it can also be indexed by more complex things like bit vectors. Um, so, uh, so, so let's, let's show this with a picture. You have a bunch of objects, C++ objects. A subset of them are globally visible objects. Let's call that the global object space. And then the uh, global object space is divided among processors by the runtime. That is, objects are partitioned or assigned to processors by the runtime. The objects that are not globally visible, each one of them must belong to exactly one migratable object, so that if, some, uh, if one of them migrates, it takes its uh, object, uh, sequential objects with it. Um, now, let's see what happens in the execution model, um, what we mean by message-driven execution. Um, the processor on the left, let's call it processor zero, decides to invoke method foo in object 23 of the collection A. It's going to just say A sub 23 dot foo and some parameters, and the uh, system is uh, going to package those into, an, um, um, into a message with an envelope that has the address of that A23. The runtime system's location manager is going to figure out where it thinks the A23 currently lives, and it's going to send that me message to that processor where it just sits in, in a queue. Eventually, it comes to the front of the queue, and the scheduler says, hey, A23, that's what I see on the envelope. Is that object still here? If it is still here, then I'm going to invoke the method. If it is not, I'm going to forward it to the right place, but the such forwarding is needed very rarely. So I invoke the met uh, method, let it run to completion, and in the process, it might generate other method invocations for other processors, and then it continues um, ex execution in this fashion. So this is the basic execution model. If you understand it completely, then you have understood a lot of programming uh, details, the, the need for asynchronous programming and so on, just by referring back to this picture. Now the runtime system is mediating communication between objects. It's the one which decides where the object lives and so on. It's also me uh, mediating scheduling, so it knows how long each pro object ran, and so it knows which objects are heavy, which are light, who is talking to whom. It can use that information to migrate objects around during the execution so as to affect various kinds of optimizations. So basic picture is that once you have over decomposition, asynchrony, and migratability, and you add a, a runtime that does introspection, and then add some adaptive strategies, you get an adaptive runtime strategy. This is the basic idea. We'll look at some of its benefits in a second. The overall development of CHAMP++ and, uh, has been driven by applications. It was co-developed with NAMD and co-developed with ma many other applications. And so this synergistic development is responsible for many of the features in CHAMP++ that are really useful for, uh, for, for, applic uh, for uh, CSE applications. So to summarize, CHAMP++ is a way of parallel programming based on objects, or decomposition, migratability, et cetera, and it has been co-developed with multiple CSE applications. One thing, when we talk about objects, the question always is, how big are these objects? Uh, they are not tiny so that each floating point number is an object. They are not something that uh, you need to very carefully uh, optimize ahead of time. You can parameterize them. But just to give you an idea of how, how they are, I'll pick some examples. One from a long time ago, uh, we, uh, we're running something with 16 uh, processors. Normally, METI should have partitioned to 16 chunks. Instead, it is partitioned to 128 chunks, and each one of those chunks is an object, so that there are eight for each processor. So that's the kind of thing that we en end up doing. In general, if you look at grain size and its impact on performance, on one processor, if you have a very tiny grain size, you'll get very high overhead. And if you have, uh, but then that subsides pretty quickly. If you have lots of processors, then the uh, large uh, grain size would mean you don't have adequate parallelism and you suffer at the right end. But there is a significant region in the middle, and we prefer that you stay to the left end of that region so as to give the runtime enough flexibility to move objects around. Um, just an example of an experiment we did in just a stencil computation on two nodes, just with two cores, uh, one on each on different node, we find that uh, two megabytes per char was the, uh, was the sweet spot there. Um, we're looking at another application. This is a Brazilian uh, 
a version of the RAMS code uh, doing weather simulation. This was done on top of CHAM++ using a library called AMPI. Um, and as the storm passes the Brazilian coastline, some of the 64 processors get overloaded, as shown here by the red col color there, uh, and some remain underloaded. By decomposing this into 1,024 objects instead of, um, oh, let's see, um, uh, instead of um, 64, running on 64 cores, you get immediate benefit from communication computation overlap, you get some additional benefit from load balancing, and overall, the performance improved per time step from 46 seconds to 27 seconds. So this is to give you an idea of uh, the grain size. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of the benefits of this model. Um, first benefit has to do with locality. Objects basically represent encapsulation, and therefore they connote, uh, connote and promote locality. Uh, you access data that's within your object, and if it is not within your object, you have to do an me asynchronous method invocation for it. Secondly, looking at the scheduler's queue, we can tell which objects are going to run next. And so we can prefetch their data in faster memories, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so that's another thing that the runtime can automatically do for you. Communication is another interesting uh, story. So the communication network in a somewhat caricatured MPI application is used very sporadically. You have compute, communicate, compute, communicate, and these communication phases might be narrow. Well, from the point of view of uh, the network, uh, the communication comes in short bursts, and then it has to deal with that, all that communication during that short period. With CHAM++, you have lots of objects communicating, so the injection gets spread over the time step. As it is, in addition, no one is waiting for one particular message. You're waiting for any one of them that arrives and schedule it accordingly. So that also helps adaptive overlap of communication and computation. A few years ago, we did an experiment with Chambo, um, which is a uh, well-known framework. Um, and, and with a, running a particular application, this was done by Phil Miller, it actually, you can see that the communication uh, which is on y-axis and x-axis is time intervals, is bunched. There are some millisecond intervals where there is a lot of data, uh, 20, 25 megabytes injected every milliseconds uh, there, whereas uh, doing this with CHAM++, on, um, uh, Chambo running on CHAM++, the injection was spread out over the time step, and as a result, the peak was uh, significantly reduced. Um, you can see that typically with MPI, we decompose uh, work to processors, um, and instead, we, we decompose work independent of the number of processes. This has several advantages, one of which is dealing with multi-physics codes. So an example inspired by the rocket simulation uh, for the rocket center that we had on campus here, uh, you have a, uh, some, uh, some rocket being simulated. It has solid components. It has fluid components. Uh, the burning uh, fuel goes out as fluids. And, and, and so typical thing is for solids are maybe unstructured mesh, fluids is structured mesh, and Metis will partition the solids and some other partitioner will partition the fluid, and then the 17th partition of solid and 17th partition of fluid will be running on MPI rank 17, mainly because their partitioners call them 17th, no real reason. Um, with CHAM++, you have solids and fluids in separate sets of uh, um, objects arrays, and there may be M fluid objects and N solid objects, and then you don't have to worry about who lives uh, together with whom on which processor. Let the runtime decide that based on who talks to whom more. So these are, these are the basic benefits of the programming model. Now I'm going to move on to uh, adaptive MPI, which is another uh, which is a programming system based on the same ideas built on top of CHAM++, and I'm going to come back to a little bit more of syntax uh, and details of CHAM++ after that. So adaptive MPI, like I said, is an MPI implementation. It's a regular, full-fledged MPI implementation where it doesn't comply with standard. It's because we are remiss. We work uh, continually to make it, uh, work, it uh, work with the standard, so it is a full-fledged, intended to be a full-fledged MPI implementation. Um, so each MPI rank is implemented as a virtual thread, virtual uh, rank, um, as a lightweight thread embedded inside a CHAM++ object. So each node might have many cores, each core may have many, many ranks uh, on, on it. And so, um, 
So then this uh, gives access to all of these CHAMP++ dynamic features, uh, such as load balancing. Um, so, uh, so we already seen those benefits. I won't go through them again. But there is one major disadvantage, which is if you're taking an existing MPI application, then you face this. If you're writing a new MPI application, you just have to remember not to use global variables as much. Global variables are shared by all threads and in an OS process. And MPI rank assumes that each global variable, there is only one copy and it's its own copy. This assumption is in conflict with this idea of user level threads. And so what you have to do is use uh, avoid using global variables, use stack variables instead. You can use read-only data as global variables. And that's easy enough to write in a new program. If you have an existing MPI program, then you, you have to convert it to this style of using it. And then, uh, uh, and, and we have ongoing work supported by DOE now uh, for fully automating that process. But even when you, uh, as you will see in an example, even when you don't have a fully automatic support for it, the work involved is not much at all. How does this work? Well, um, we, we have uh, uh, basically the, uh, the, the idea is that you, you have uh, individual uh, processes, uh, within each process you have multiple ranks. Each rank has its own stack because it's a user level thread. These stacks are migratable across processors because using, we use a technique, virtual memory technique called isomalloc. You can also use isomalloc based heap memory allocator. So all your allocations go through our special memory allocator, which allows us to just simply M map and then move the data to the new processor when you migrate an entire rank to another processor, which is a much lightweight operation than uh, migrating a process. Uh, all that you have to do is you have to add a call for enabling load balancing to AMPI migrate. It's a collective call, AMPI migrate, and you provide an MPI info object which says that, hey, I want load balancing done. And then uh, then, then you, it's, it's as if each rank will uh, call, make this call, close its eyes, when it wakes up, it might be on a different core, on a different node, uh, wherever it might be in the same place where it was before. Um, it's just giving the runtime system a chance to do load balancing. Now, if you want to add fault tolerance, um, you can f do it in two ways. First of all, you can just do uh, checkpoints, automa automated checkpoints, uh, because we migrate these uh, threads for load balancing. We can migrate them to a disk. And so all that you have to do is uh, one call, uh, MPI migrate, and you just provide a different MPI info that says that, hey, I'm, I want it to be checkpointed to a, uh, to a disk. When you return from that call, you're done. Uh, you can also use a scalable fault detection algorithm in, uh, instead of the uh, first one, which is checkpoint, and at some point you can restart it. Uh, the, uh, and the scalable uh, restart fault detection just uses a heartbeat uh, mechanism to detect uh, uh, fail stop failures, and when some process or some node has failed, it will detect that and it will go back to the last checkpoint which is stored in memory or maybe on SSD and restart uh, fr uh, from that and continue execution. This is really fast uh, restart after failure. In the first case too, when you checkpoint, you can actually restart on a different number of physical nodes than you had before. You're maybe running something on 1,000 nodes, and you checkpointed it, and now you have 1,200 available. No problem. It's the virtual ranks will spread around uh, themselves around the 1,200 nodes. Uh, interesting communication optimizations uh, uh, exist in AMPI that even MPI does not have access to. So this is some more recent results, so I, uh, I will spend a minute on them. Um, so, so if you look at uh, what, 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 the, what a single node looks like, you, uh, well, a single OS process looks like in AMPI implementation, you have multiple schedulers, one for each core. There is a uh, scheduler running for, for a, a core that's just running COM threads, does not house any ranks, and this is dealing with the communication. And then uh, uh, each one of these cores holds multiple ranks. Now the question is, when rank two wants to send a message to rank three, they are on the same core, can we do it fast? Or if rank two wants to send a message to rank 63, they are in different cores, but on the same node, how fast can we do it? Well, it turns out our implementation can do it much faster than what MPI can do. In some ways, you can think of uh, our implementation as an uh, implementation of the endpoints, so multiple endpoints idea in, uh, 
in MPI. So uh, to show some of the performance data, um, the, uh, on the left, uh, uh, you see sm short messages. The green curve is um, MPI shared memory sending a data within the same core, from one rank to another rank, they both housed on the same core. The more common situation from the MPI's point of view, two cores, uh, two different cores, that's the blue one here, and both of them are pretty fast compared with the standard implementations such as OpenMPI, or MWAPH, and so on, and IMPI there. Large message sizes, we do very, very well as well for both the single core and two different cores scenarios. Use of uh, bandwidth, uh, we do as good as the stream uh, cop copy speeds, so uh, pretty fast there as well for AMPI P2, which is using two different cores, and P1 is doing okay uh, com compared with the others. Um, uh, not, uh, somewhat slower there for that bandwidth. Um, let's see. So what does it take to compile and run an MPI program? Well, you just uh, use our MPI wrapper, MP MPI CC, that knows the appropriate switches um, and so on, so you don't have to hunt for the right uh, options to provide. And if you want migratability, link with memory isomalloc, and if you want load balancing strategies, link with uh, module com LBs, and so just that. And then after that, to run it, instead of using MPI run, you use CHAM run, and now you get to specify the virtual ranks as well as the actual ranks. So, uh, so you can say here in the last line, please run this program on 1024 physical cores, pretending to be 16,000 vir uh, virtual cores, virtual ranks, and use this particular load balancer uh, for, uh, for, uh, for balancing uh, work across processors. So as a case study, I'm going to uh, discuss Lulesh, uh, which is the uh, proxy application from, uh, from Livermore, uh, which has some Im Im imbalance, some synthetic or artificial load balance uh, that has been included to test different run times. And this step turns out to be, again, like many applications, like um, the framework uh, Hypre, for example, has no mutable global or static variables, and so you can run it on AMPI as it is. Uh, no conversion is needed. All that you do is replace MPI CC with AMPI CC and uh, those link options that is suggested, and then we just ran it on 2,000 cores um, um, with, with a load balancer. You can see what happens first in a run without virtualization. You run on 2,000 cores uh, with 2,000 ranks, no virtualization, and uh, you're going to get these purple stretches here, which are MPI all reduced cost. This particular core got done with its red work, and then it's waiting for the all reduced to finish, and some other core is taking a long time to come to that all reduced point, and so on. And when all of them arrive, it, it finishes and it does some work, and so on. So there's going to be a lot of idle time, mainly not because MPI all reduced is slow, but because there is load imbalance. Um, and so, and so by adding uh, load, load balancing, uh, well, before that, communication, again, the same type of curve that I showed before, communication uh, on x-axis and the number of bytes received on y-axis, you can see that they are bunched together. Um, so, so the network is underutilized most of the time. You're going to go to your vendor and say, bring me a faster network because when I use it, I want it running fast, but really you are not using it most of the time. When you do it with AMPI, all those waiting times are gone um, because it balanced, and then you load balanced it, uh, so different virtual objects get, got moved around, and so now everyone has roughly equal amount of work, and so there is no large purple uh, all reduced uh, time there. Um, so, uh, and then whatever point-to-point -point waiting time was is also overlapped by computation. If you look at the virtual, this is the picture of the physical ranks. You can actually turn on in projections, which is the performance visualization tool, a view where you can actually just see all the virtual ranks on each core. And you can, when you do that, you can see that the green area here is all those weights. Um, MPI weight for the all reduce and so on, those are the green things here. MPI all reduce calls are here. So different 
virtual ranks are still waiting for those communication operations to finish, but their weights are kind of parallelized. Their weights are overlapped with each other so that someone or the other is doing useful computation on that, on that core. Uh, that's how it gets this good performance. Now, um, what happened to the communication? Well, it got spread out over, over time, and the y-axis peaks uh, got reduced as a res result of that. Um, so to summarize uh, adaptive MPI, uh, adaptive MPI or MPI provides the same dynamic runtime support that we have in CHAM++ with the MPI standard API. It provides communication automizations that are automatic. It provides automatic load balancing, fault tolerance, checkpoint restart. Uh, and I will uh, touch this point again. Uh, it, you can also run this with OpenMP. Uh, we have our own OpenMP runtime, uh, um, and, and you can run uh, it with that, where each rank might fire OpenMP uh, loop iterations, and they may typically be run on the same core, but if other cores are idle, they will steal them uh, from, from you. So this, in a way, is a nested parallelism. But you can also do with AMPI another mode where you run AMPI such that it's assigning all its virtual ranks to just one core of each process, and the remaining cores are free to be used by your favorite within node parallelization system, such as OpenMP. Um, right. So there's more information about AMPI on our website, and I'm going to give you at the end reference to the, to the website. I'm going to switch our topic now back to CHAM++. It, and uh, if there are any questions, this would be a good time to uh, pause for questions. If you have questions, feel free to post them on YouTube live chat or in the Slack channel, however you're connected. All right, I'll, I'll continue then. Um, if, if there is an immediate question, please stop me. But. Um, so, uh, so, so we're going to now look at CHAM++ with a little bit of syntax. Um, and um, then, of course, there's a lot more detailed uh, syntax-oriented tutorial material that I will point, to, point you to later on. But I wanted to give you a flavor of what CHAM++ programming um, uh, feels like. And in fact, introduce all of the basic concepts in the process. So on the right here, you see a C++ class uh, called main and a program with a class main and class singleton, um, and they're doing something. Basically not much, it's just a hello world. Uh, I will explain what they're doing in a second. But in CHAM++, you have to help the runtime, help the CHAM system by providing an additional interface file that says what char classes you have and what kind of methods can be remotely invoked, that is which methods are entry methods and what their parameters are. This helps the system prepare uh, uh, for example, code that will serialize your method invocations and put them in an envelope and send them off. So for that purpose, you write an interface file called the .ci file here on the left. Uh, and uh, corresponding to this C++ file, this um, CI file has a module called hello, which says there is a main char, which says there is a single char for every ent uh, high level entity on your program that needs to be system visible, you need to declare it here. The en uh, here, there are no other entry methods beyond the constructor methods for this program, so you just declare them, you just show them. And now, um, what the system does is this, this CI file is processed by the Charms, uh, 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 translator to generate code for classes uh, such as that you see on here, uh, cbase main or cbase singleton. For a, a class singleton, there is a it inherits from a C-based singleton, which is generated using the declarations here by the charm system, and it includes some uh, some inherited uh, fields that we, the runtime needs and that you need as a programmer. You also generate C proxy classes, and we'll see more about them uh, them later, uh, which uh, support m methods for, for example, for creating a new char. So, how do these CI files work? Basically, in a C++ program, you have a .h and .cpp in uh, CHAM++ you have .h, .cpp, and a .ci file, uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the ch char objects, classes, and entry methods are, are defined in the .ci file, and, um, and they are, of course, you provide their implementation in the C++ file. For compiling it, 
you feed the, the CI file to Charm C. It produces some uh, classes. We'll see where they get included, and then um, you compile your C++ uh, as as usual to create an executable, and then you run the program by say feeding it to Charm Run instead of MPI Run on most machines, and then uh, number of processors and the name of the program. This part might be somewhat variable from machine to machine, and you can look at the particular machines. Uh, uh, the uh, documentation for how to run it. So, uh, so that just this, uh, pictorially uh, shows the process. Decal and def files are produced by Charm C. These are then included. These are the classes that the system defined that are uh, included at the top of .h file if you have a header file, and the definitions are included at the bottom of some C file that you have. That you uh, th that that. Um, and, and then the, that's how your entire program is, which is compiled by a C compiler into an object file. We do have a question. You mentioned that load balancing relies on assessment of who talks to whom, so you can bunch processes by degree of communication. Is there an API to get at this who talks to whom info at runtime, so an application can use this information itself? Um, Yes, it's actually within within runtime data structure, but since load balancing itself is a modular piece in Charm++, the load balancing database, as we call it, is a separable piece that can be available. First of all, it can be dumped to disk if you want to analyze it offline, or it can be made available for you to analyze. Uh, it's essentially like writing a, your own load balancer, except in, in this case, you might just want to read it and not do the load balancing. So yes, that's, uh, that can be gotten hold of. OK. So now, returning back to our very simple program, um, let's look at some of the other components. I already said that the C-based main com comes from um, uh, the decal file and def file here, generated using uh, the .ci. Uh, now notice that the main char is going to create a, a, hello ch a singleton char, and the singleton char is going to print hello world and then quit, quit execution. Now, Creating a new object normally would just involve call new, but here I am calling CK new, and that to CK new on a proxy class that corresponds to the class of which you are generating an instance. Just plain new won't do because all that the plain C++ new operator will do is create a local sequential C++ object that's not visible to the runtime system. So you got to use this. Uh, uh, thing that defined by us called CK new, and it's from the generated code based on the singleton class. Um, now, similarly here, you can see the print statement looks normal, except this looks like a typo there, CK out. Well, that's not a typo. We use our own stream called CK out instead of C out. Uh, this was more necessary in old times when the when you're running on workstations and uh, the process you didn't know what to do with C out that's coming from a disembodied process there. Uh, but C out is a convention to uh, to do printouts. Notice another thing, which is exit. We didn't call exit, we call CK exit. Why is that? Well, you have to go back to this picture here. There are a bunch of processes. Each one is a scheduler looking at their queue. Just because there's an empty queue doesn't mean the program is done. Someone sometime will send me a message in future. So these schedulers are going to keep running. So if one of them just calls exit and that process dies, you didn't kill the whole program. You just condemn everyone else to sit in a loop forever waiting for a message that they were expecting maybe from you or do some useless computation because the program has exited. Um, so CK exit basically does a proper wrap up uh, and, and then after that turns off all the schedulers. Uh, CK exit doesn't itself cause the, uh, termination, so you can do a print after C calling CK exit, for example. Um, all right, another example for entry method invocation, and this example is going to do double duty. It's going to show how to do method invocation, and it's going to also show you some traps uh, in asynchronous programming. So you have a main char called main, and you have a simple char, which is constructor simple with a parameter uh, y, which is a double, and a find area method, which is an entry method, which means someone else can invoke it, and it has two parameters, a radius and a boolean called done. What we want it to do is by the constructor, we want to inform the uh, simple char 
what the value of pi is in this universe. Of course, that we could hard code that, but for the sake of example, we're going to provide the value of pi that I want you to use here. And then in a loop here, ten, nine times I'm going to call uh, find area entry method. That's a entry method invocation that's asynchronous, so the call gets made. It This call returns right away, but underlying uh, method invocation is on its way to some destination processor where the simple objects for which the proxy is this thing called sim exists. Um, and so, um, and so, uh, and then that's being done from one to 10, that's nine times, and then every time I'm feeding that i to it, and then the 10th time I feed a 10, and this time I send the second parameter as true, saying I'm done. This one is false, this one is true, and all that the simple objects constructor does is just records that y, um, the, 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 what gets sent to it as the value of pi that's given to it by the main char, and then, in the find area method, it simply calculates y r r, y pi r square, and prints it. And then it decides whether to call ck exit or not, and it says, well, if the done boolean is true, that means uh, the main char is telling me to exit, and so I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, tell the whole entire program to exit. Now, where will these two charts exist? There are only two charts in the program. Maybe they're both on the same core, maybe, maybe they're on two different cores. It really doesn't matter for the semantics of the program. Um, now, is this program correct? Think for just a minute about, about this program and know that when you send the method invocations towards an object, it takes its own time. System does not guarantee in-order delivery. Uh, the messages may get reordered in the queue, they may get reordered in the network. We are not going to pay the overhead of in-order delivery unless we need it. And if you need it, there are mechanisms for ensuring that for that specific case. So since in-order delivery is not supported, what can happen is the entry method invocations that you sent look like this, find area one, find area two, find area nine, all of them with second parameter is false, and then 10th uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, with true for the second parameter. But they may not be delivered in the same order. So here what might happen is, well, you get that, uh, the very first message that you sent with i equals one got processed here, fourth, and some, something else um, got processed first, and so on, and so But as soon as the tenth one gets processed, you're going to exit. In this case, you got lucky, you processed all 10, but maybe that 314 comes only the fifth message, and then you're going to say, hey, uh, done is true, I'm exiting. Well, there are five of them on, on their way in the network and the queue somewhere, and you didn't deal with them. So this program failed because you did not take into account the asynchrony of the programming model. One way of fixing it, there are many ways of fixing it. I'll just show you one way, which is kind of uh, a simple cop-out way, and it basically says, if I have received 10 messages, then I can call CK exit. Then that will work, work correctly. And there are, you, uh, you might want to think very, uh, um, uh, think about writing very careful programs where you don't depend on the knowledge that there are going to be 10 messages coming to you uh, uh, until, until the sender decides to send you that message in, let's say, the last call. Uh, can you make that work? Well, you can, uh, but I will let you think about that. So, I'm, I'm, uh, so this basically uh, ends the topic on chars and entry method, asynchronous entry method invocations, and I'm going to move to char arrays, another point for any question uh, for, for the previous uh, section. So, um, so now I had mentioned earlier that chars can be organized into indexed collections. Um, okay, so, uh, so I'm going to have to uh, speed things uh, a little bit here. But, uh, but index collections of charts, where every item in the collection has a unique index, uh, and I, I said all of these properties before, elements may be dynamically inserted. You can have an array of 10,000 charts and you can insert 10 more in the execution, maybe doing adaptive refinements and so on. So the, uh, maybe the syntax for that, those I will just uh, roughly uh, describe. You have the entry method foo, um, let me, how am I doing on time? Yeah, okay. Okay, so I think I have time to describe this syntax. So uh, earlier, the .ci file 
had chars Fu and Bar and described them as chars, if they are to be parts of a char array, we call, defi, describe them as array 1D uh, rather than um, just char here. And bar is a two-dimensional array, so we say bar, uh, array 2D. This simply means bar is a char type which is going to be organized, instances of which are going to be organized into a two-dimensional array. Okay, uh, and, uh, and so when you create it, you basically say uh, CKNU as before, you have cproxy foo. Remember, your class was called foo, and so you have cproxy foo generated by the system. You're going to say seek new. You're going to pass it the constructor parameters, and then the last parameter is going to be how many elements you want me to create. So the run, uh, you're telling the runtime, hey, please create for me an array of 10 charts to constructor of each one of them provide these parameters. So these will be given to every one of them. And where will these 10 charts exist? Well, that's up to the runtime system. Uh, you are not saying where, where they should exist. You have a ability to specify that initial placement if you want to, but uh, we won't get into uh, that here. Similarly for bar, you are providing the constructor parameters and it's a 2D array, so you're saying, hey, please make for me a five by five array. Of course, in real applications, this might be 100,000 and this might be 100 by 500 or something like that. Pretty large char arrays exist. And then, uh, then, then the question is, how does method invocation change? Previously, when you had a proxy for a char, you could just invoke an entry method on it by saying proxy.invoke entry. But here, you have to specify which member of that collection are you talking about? Because my foo is a proxy to the entire char array. So my foo square bracket four is a proxy specialized for the fourth element, and you can invoke that entry there. My bar, instead of using square bracket for two dimensional and higher dimensional things, you, you have to use um, parentheses. My bar two comma four invoke method three um, on it. So that's the syntax for asynchronous method invocation. Now, when you have an element of a char array, when you are executing code inside the, of that, sometimes you want to say, who am I? Kind of like my rank in MPI. Uh, what is my index? This proxy exists. This is simply the C++ object pointer. This proxy is a handle or a pointer to the entire char array. This index is your place in it. So if it's a one-dimensional char array, this index returns the uh, current char array element. I am seven, seventh element of this char array. If it is a 2D, this index return is a structure. You can have X and Y field. You have X and Y fields in it, and so on. Um, all right. Now we'll do a, a, a two examples. Uh, so the first one is again a hello world type example. We're going to have a main char, that's just a singleton char, and a hello, which is a char array, which contains the constructor as well as another entry method called print hello. So all that we want to have happen is that for main to create a collection and the main to tell the zeroth element of the collection, hey, say hello, and it's going to say hello and then pass that message to the uh, invoke invocation to the next char in the link and so on, and everyone is going to say uh, hello by printing hello on, on the terminal. So the C++ code looks like this. You have uh, this call here creating the char array, as I said before, with this how many elements you want in here. So we are creating one with uh, whatever number of uh, uh, array size is provided on the command line here. What is this second array size doing here? Well, that's the constructor argument. We are telling the, uh, uh, giving the constructor uh, for each element the total array size. We could provide that in different ways. Here I just want to illustrate it by providing it as a constructor argument. Now, um, the hello class itself is again a uh, subclass of CBase hello. The system generated one. Whatever parameter is passed to you, you save it as a ray size. And when print hello gets to you, you can use CK printf instead of CK out if you want. You just print your hello with this index. You also get to see, even though the programming model is agnostic to processors, actually, you should not use which processor you are on for any programming purposes in a pure champ program, but you get to peek at who, which physical processor is running this. And then you can uh, say, well, on which physical processor and what is my index this hello message is coming from? And then after that, you get to decide. Well, 
Am I at the end? Should I call CK exit or should I go on? Well, if I'm not the last char, then I just need to call the uh, print hello in the next char in the chain. What is that? Well, this proxy is the proxy to this entire char array, uh, and then this index plus one is the index of the next one, if it exists, and I know because of this if statement that it exists, and so I call that. Um, on the other hand, if my index is the same as array size minus one, which means I'm the last one, I call CK exit. Um, and uh, now, now that's, that's how you do point-to-point -point messages. How do you broadcast? Well, that's very simple. All that you have to do is proxy.foo. If, uh, if you are calling from inside the char array, some method inside the char array, you can say this proxy.foo. If you're calling from anywhere else, as long as you have the proxy, you can say proxy.foo. And since you did not specify which element, it goes to everyone. It's a broadcast to everyone. The reductions are slightly more involved, and for a good reason. Uh, in a reduction, you want to combine a set of values, each coming from, let's say in scalar reduction, one value coming from each object of an array, and then you want to combine them using some kind of a uh, operation such as sum or max. Uh, so each object calls contribute into a reduction, but we don't want it to be a blocking call. Everything in CHAMP++, including the broadcast you saw earlier, is asynchronous, non-blocking. So you make the broadcast call, you re return immediately from the broadcast call, you can do all kinds of other things. At some point in future, the broadcasted method invocation will be delivered to each one of your uh, objects at different points in time, actually. Similarly, in contribution, you are going to contribute your contribution into a reduction, and then you're going to move on. You might even process other method invocations and so on. So how does that call look? Well, here is another simple example. Um, you have uh, a main char, and you have, I'm not showing the .ci file here, and you have an lm char, which is a, a char array. And then all that the main char is doing is creating a char array with, uh, the, of lms, and then uh, the constructors are saying, I need to contribute a number. What number? Well, let's just contribute your own index into, into a reduction. So what does the contribute call look like? The second line first. What you are contributing, that's the value and how many bytes it is. Uh, what kind of operation you want done? It's a some int operation. And then where should the result go, which is this callback here. You just constructed the callback in the previous sentence here, and the callback in the simple case is basically saying, hey, send it to the done entry method of the main main char, and I need to have the proxy, that's just the main class. The particular proxy was provided to me as a parameter, constructor parameter, this proxy here. I know that as main M proxy, and I provide that in the callback. So there are all kinds of different callbacks available in the CHAM runtime system. That's a special, a separate topic by itself. But this is how the reductions work. When you make the contribute call, maybe everyone else has already made their contribute call. And then you can still do other things while that contributions all get added through a spanning tree or whatever uh, through the entire parallel machine. Other activities can proceed. A MPI has recently added non-blocking uh, collective calls. Champ++ has had them fr from before, and so this is how they work in Champ++. So, uh, so the basic picture is you program. Yes. Uh, let me just complete this uh, summary. You program with the left picture in mind. You have multiple collections of objects, you in invoke asynchronously the methods, and then the runtime is assigning those and scheduling those to processes, like the picture in the right. Yes? So we have a question. Are you limited to 2D arrays, or are there 3D or ND oh, arrays uh, too? I, I, I believe the limit is seven dimensions right, right now. Uh, so you can go up to seven dimensions. In fact, m some of our uh, examples in many apps need six-dimensional arrays because they're talking about pairs of neighboring cubes. So uh, so 6D is a very commonly needed abstraction uh, for us. Okay. Um, so how to use load balancing? Um, I, uh, so basically, uh, so the runtime is going to migrate objects. Based on what? Based on load information. And the load information come, can come from multiple sources. The source that we typically rely on is measurement-based load balancing. That is to say, many of CHAMP++ applications use load balancer based on this principle of persistence, which says that object communication patterns and their computational loads tend to persist over time. 
And this is true even when there is dynamic behavior. There is typically either abrupt but infrequent change or there is slow or small change as particles migrate, for example. So, um, so runtime instrumentation captures what's happening and then the measurement-based load balancers uh, uh, act on that. So you just have to link a module for load balancer. There are several strategies available, and we are trying to automate so that you don't even have to think about which strategy to use um, in the current version about to be released in 6.9. That will be the standard. And then uh, you can override those decisions by at compiler runtime. The instrumentation is turned on by default, but sometimes you might want to say, hey, don't turn it on all the time. You have a couple of calls available for turning the instrumentation on and off. You can just before calling load balancer, which you call with a, f a function call called at sync, a few iterations before that, you can turn the instrumentation on and then turn it off after load balancing again. Uh, to you, every char array, every char that wants to be considered for migration needs to say use this at sync to be true, and then you make the call at sync when you want it to be my, um, yourself to be migrated. Basically saying, hey, this is a good point to lift me and put me on some other processor if you want. Um, and then the system, when it, uh, at this point, the system will tell you, I migrated you or I did not migrate you, but in any case, you are resumed by making a call resume from sync. So I was going to show an example, but uh, you can look at the example later. This is a stencil-like application. I will just very briefly uh, say it. You have messages coming from left and right, and when the remote count becomes equal to two, you got both messages, you do do work, and in the do work, you do something and you contribute into a reduction, which will go to the main proxy, which will say you're done or not done, and accordingly continue the time step or not. You want to add load balancing to it, all that you have to do is basically to say, hey, every 10 steps, let me call at sync, in which case I'm going to continue here, only otherwise contribute into the reduction. Uh, in, in the case the load balancing is called, I'll continue here and contribute into the reduction. And so the program continues in that fashion. That's all you have to do to enable load balancing. To, of course, uh, al allow the system to do load balancing, you need to add some serialization code, which I'm going to skip the de details of. It's called PUP, and you can read about it in the manual. Um, instead, I'm, uh, I'm going to describe well, uh, let me also say using these load balancing features, you can do checkpoint restart, you can do automatic fault tolerance, and again, for checkpoint restart, for example, uh, all, all that you have to do is to uh, provide a callback say CK start checkpoint and a directory name where you want uh, it stored and the callback where you want execution to continue. If you want the fault tolerance, oh, this will just deposit a checkpoint and continue. If you want fault tolerance, you just uh, make a different call which will just keep depositing in memory checkpoints from point to point. Um, I'm going to skip past the next few slides uh, and talk about some advanced uh, f features. Um, some of the uh, things that uh, people have been recently curious about, what about GPGPUs? Yes, they are supported. Um, there is a GPU manager module uh, which provides, which kind of bridges the gap between the uh, CUDA's model, and traditional usage model, and the CHAMP++ asynchronous model, where you can fire off uh, uh, kernels as you please, and then the callbacks will come to you as CHAMP++ uh, messages that are get, get get integrated through the CHAMP++ plus plus schedulers running on, on the individual cores. Uh, multiple cores are supported in many ways. You can, of course, use CHAMP++ plus plus as it is. You can use it with OpenMP. I mentioned this earlier. You can have one PE on each process. Um, uh, in that's this second mode here, and then you can just run OMS or OpenMP or uh, Parsec or anything else you want to run. Uh, or we have our own OpenMP implementation where charts are running on different cores, each one can fire their own OpenMP loops, and the system will decide whether they need to be moved to other cores or not. CHAMP++ interoperates with MPI, so you can actually write some modules in CHAMP++ and the rest in MPI, that's fine. Um, Control flow within an individual char can be expressed with a script-like notation called structured dagger. 
uh, or it can also be expressed by threaded entry methods which use user level threads, very lightweight migratable user level threads, which is what AMPI uses, for example. And then these can be used with futures. So you can block for various things such as futures, and there are calls for setting futures and uh, waiting for futures. Uh, and then you can also have ge more general purpose suspending threads and resuming threads based on uh, availability of some data. And so you can do interesting things with that as well. Um, some additional advanced concepts are mentioned here. Um, I want to only point out a couple of them because I want to talk about some uh, case studies as just illustrate how the objects work. Projections and Champ debug are tools that are very useful. Projections is a very advanced performance visualization uh, tool. Live is you can inject messages into a running Champ program. You can get out online visualizations without needing a separate sets of processes and so on. Um, to make a couple of use cases for to make some points, I'm uh, I'm going to talk about very briefly about um, NAMD, which is a biomolecular simulation program. You have a bunch of atoms. Well, how do does it look with objects? Well, you have a bunch of objects decomposed into cubes, and then then bunch of objects for force calculations. Maybe ten times more objects for force calculation than than the cubes. A uh, bunch of objects for bonded calculations. Particle mesh AVAL, which is an FFT-based method, is implemented by another sets of objects, and these objects are spread across processors uh, as, as before. Uh, uh, Changa is a parallel gravity uh, sim uh, uh, simulation. Again, octree pieces can be created without worrying about their equal size or not, but they have good geometry and they're sufficiently small, satisfying our grain size needs, and then the charm runtime system can uh, distribute them to processors to do gravity or SPH calculations. Uh, Open Atom, which is a quantum chemistry Carpernello type application. Again, dozens of char arrays, each one with tens of thousands of objects, can be used to express the computation much cleanly than a single MPI uh, one, uh, code would be. We have a set of uh, many apps that you can browse for looking at what the actual programs look like at this URL here. And I have listed the uh, mini apps uh, on, on, on this page, which I won't go through. And there is a, a book a few years ago that describes seven of these uh, applications. Uh, one additional point I would make, fault tolerance and energy are issues that keep coming up at exascale. I already talked about fault tolerance. If you've seen the demos at supercomputing, we actually allow you to unplug one of the uh, Raspberry Pi type nodes and uh, uh, let the uh, program continue. For energy, I just want to show you one example. If you want to save cooling energy, what do you do? Well, you just go to the wall, turn the air conditioning setting up, so and you save cooling energy. Well, but some cores may get too hot and burn out. You don't want that. Well, let the runtime monitor core temperatures and reduce the frequency of a chip or a core, uh, if it allows that, uh, using RAPL or DVFS. Now what happens? Well, you create load imbalance. One core is running some of the things slower. That's a problem we know how to handle. We can just migrate objects around, take into account the variable speeds of different cores, and we restored uh, pretty good performance without uh, losing uh, 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 and saved energy. You can use that idea at a runtime at a sch job scheduler level by using the shrinkable and expandable jobs and power requirements and make a power aware resource manager, for example, which we have done in our research. So um, I just want to close with this uh, slide. I'm going to, uh, I'm announcing a lecture series. By announcing it here, I'm committing to it, doing it. Uh, there will be a lecture series at champplusplus.org under learn. Uh, I will put some uh, instructional material along with lecture videos for uh, uh, Champ++, plus plus, including the advanced material. The mini apps, I already gave you the link. Uh, the uh, Champ paper is, uh, site is where my research group's papers are, and th there is commercial support now available through hpccharm.com. So this part is what I'm excited about, hopefully doing in the next few weeks, uh, starting in the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, while we... Uh finish up here. If you have additional questions, feel free to post them on YouTube Live or the uh, Slack channel. We do have a question. Has a Charm++ application ever been integrated with YT, the Volumetric Data Management Visualization Toolkit? Um, I'm, uh, I'm, it's ringing a bell, but I'm not sure. People have used it with a variety of other visualization 
toolkits, but not 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 something that comes to my mind right away. Okay. Uh, of course, projections is there, and Livermore tools have been used with it uh, as well. Um, but I'm not. I don't remember YT. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the upcoming lecture series. Are there really any other online training materials people yes, can refer at, to? Yes, at uh, again at champlusplus.org, um, uh, under the learn setting, you will find a uh, tutorial. But the tutorial is kind of oldish. It still is good, pretty good actually. But better than that is the series of exercises, programming exercises. There may be like. Uh, four or five programming exercises there, and we are trying to beef up that so that the descriptions are updated. Ideally, those exercises should be done with supervision, like show your program to someone, uh, some experienced Champ programmer, and get feedback. But if you do those exercises well, you have learned basics of Champ plus plus well. And then, sort of a general question: Do, do you have any kind of assessment how much work it takes to adapt to Charm? Um, um, yes, not much at all, but that's me speaking. Uh, so, uh, no, this is actually, there are two things I, I, I must say. First of all, adaptive MPI has very little to learn, uh, and so people who are in the MPI world want to kind of get an idea of this, maybe use MPI. Champ++ takes a little bit of getting used to, but here is here is the my experience over the years. My grad students who come into my group, for them this is something new and weird. They take um, maybe, I mean, in terms of training material, I would say uh, if you do one week's intensive training and then do some programming assignments, that's enough to get you there, right? So my new grad students are doing courses and other things, and within a month they have become reasonably good uh, with Champ++, and then they keep needing advanced concepts uh, uh, to, be re, uh, to, to be reinforced by other group members from time to time. But the in interesting and heartwarming part of this is that I haven't had a graduate student who worked with me for a while and did not become a loyal supporter of Champ++. I say, how could the rest <laughs> of the world not see this? Uh, so, so it gets, uh, it, it, you start using it, it just, um, it's just something that you get, get used to. Now, there are people doing a variety of things. The .ci file is a distraction, and people are working on, uh, with modern C++, how to uh, eliminate the need for having to have a .ci file and so on, and that reduces some of the uh, uh, initial burden. And uh, in the last couple of years, with again at this company, uh, Chamworks, uh, because of this uh, a grant from DOE, uh, we were able to reduce a lot of resist initial hurdles which occurred because of this .ci file parsing and so on. And as, as a new user, you run into some system error or something that's your error but the system is not helping you much, you just give up on it. And why do you want to learn a new system? Many such points of resistance have been whittled down uh, through this two-year uh, grant from Department of Energy. Another question. Any thoughts about using Charm++ as a virtual machine for higher order languages? For example, an actor implementation or a distributed functional language implementation? Uh, so, yes. so you would translate and interpret the higher order language into Charm++ runtime? Yeah, Charm++ translate more, more than interpret, but you could do both. In fact, you are rekindling a really, really old memory by mentioning actors. Actors, of course, predates Champ++ just by a couple of years, um, but it does. But the first actual parallel machine implementation of actors was done by Chris Hauk with, with Gul Aga on top of Champ++, on top of Charm, what it was called Charm then. Uh, but we ourselves are implementing domain-specific languages, higher-level notations such as multiface, shared arrays, and charisma on top of uh, Champ++. It is really my hope that it, it acts as a, a, a good backend for higher-level uh, languages. We are working on it, but we really hope if people are interested in developing such, we will we'll be happy to co uh, collaborate with you. Okay, I think that's all the questions at this point then. Uh, join me in thanking Sanjay for a tremendous presentation on Charm++. Uh, I think it was very uh, informative and hopefully a good resource that people can follow up. The next scheduled webinar uh, will be uh, Beyond Exascale, The Future of HPC by Mark Smear, and that'll be uh, July 11th. Other than that, we welcome your feedback and suggestions, and we look forward to your participation again in the future. Thank you for joining us.